Hello and welcome to Nikon Report, your weekly roundup of all the latest Nikon news and all other photographic announcements that we found interesting. It's Constantine here. And this is Becky. How are you today? I'm <laughs> fine. How are you? <laughs> Good. Haven't seen you for three weeks. What's going on? Has it been as long? Oh, no. We've seen each other since then. <laughs> but the podcast has not seen us. No. They, it feels like a long time. I've missed everyone. And we're going to make this one a very fun, action-packed podcast because we haven't been on air for three weeks. What you're saying is extra long, about four hours, all analytical discussion about Nick and acquiring Red. And of course, we're going to throw in some financials. I was going to say, it has to include an element of financials. Otherwise, is it a podcast, really? Well, thank you, five of you who are still here with us. Everyone <laughs> else has left. We're not going to talk about financials. So I wanted them to leave. <laughs> and now, finally, it can be just seven of us together discussing everything. The latest and greatest, Nick. And let's start with a 28 to 400 lens because... It's now shipping worldwide. Uh, we've got our first shipments. I actually should have a lens somewhere here. <gasps> Here's one you made earlier. You've got it in your presence. Look That's at right. that. That's right. Straight from the oven. And you know what? It goes to 400. So we are looking forward to testing and taking some pictures. Don't have access to 24 to 200. So hopefully I can find one before me and Becky meet so we can compare those together. But... I'm actually surprised how small the light it is because on the pictures, it looked massive. Actually, mm -hmm. even next to 24 to 200, it's not that big, Becky. That's impressive. I'm looking forward to us testing it out in the field, which we will be doing very soon. So do stay tuned for that. We should have a video up sometime before Christmas. Yeah, definitely. Sometimes we publish Christmas videos around June, July as well. So you know what to expect from our channel. That's absolutely no problem. But I am very excited for us to try it out because... The question is, is it the one to rule them all or we all should wait for 3512 really, isn't it? <laughs> Those are two very different lenses, but I am looking forward to testing this out and seeing if, you know, with all the lenses that cover such wide ranges, does this one really do the trick? It's it's quite a large range. It Does it fall short anywhere? Anyway, all those questions will be answered very soon. So yeah. Keep your eyes peeled for that video. Exactly. Well, so far, just kind of running it on the camera on my Nikon ZF, it performs really well. Auto focus is reasonable. It's not super fast, 7200 auto focus, let's say, but it's good enough for this type of work. It focuses fairly close. Overall, the impression is very positive, but I want to compare it with 24 to 200 because I think that's kind of the lens where a lot of people are considering this. But obviously, some people are also looking at lenses that go to 400 and 600 mil, but it's kind of an interesting hybrid. So once we get our 24 to 200, we can compare both and hopefully get the video out soon, as Becky said. Now, let's move on to some firmware updates. So the fresh one of the press is Nikon Z8 firmware. They updated it to version 2.01. What did they change, Becky? Uh, so they did change the default values for some settings. Very exciting. If you're connecting wirelessly, this applies to you. So their encryption keys and password displayed after the camera's default settings are restored have changed. And then they've also fixed some issues. So there was a green color casting that occurred occasionally with some pictures taken. Apparently this was firmware, not something weird going on with your white balance. Date and time set in camera would sometimes not be correctly applied. Using picture review to view an image when you were viewing it in tool or portrait orientation and then zooming in prevented the display from being scrolled in the intended direction with the multi-selector. So quite mm -hmm. an important one if you review your pictures on the back of the screen in the tool portrait mode. Now, they also had an issue where after a firmware update, this, the eye sensor would sometimes not function and the viewfinder wouldn't turn on. Again, firmware, not a piece of fluff in your eye sensor. And then sometimes the eye menu would remain in the viewfinder when it was looked through after the shutter release button was pressed. So... A few very specific bugs, but I'm glad that they fixed them. Yeah, but you know the encryption keys and the password displayed of the camera default setting is restored. This is to wireless compatibility. And if you look at a bunch of other firmware updates that Nikon released in the last couple of weeks, it's all in there. And that is to do with the compliance with European laws and this whole wireless network connections on 
all gadgets, including cameras. That's what it does. So, for example, Z5 firmware was also updated to 1.43 version, and that also includes encryption keys and password displayed after camera's default settings are restored. Z50 and Z30 had identical updates, as well as D6, surprisingly, but there's some other things that they've done to global navigation satellite system. Okay, yeah, they have actually improved acquisition performance when used in certain areas where the quasi-Zenith satellite, the QZSS, can be acquired. So you can access that satellite in certain areas now thanks to this firmware update. And then we had D780 update, encryption keys, yay, Coolpix P950, the same thing, change the default password displayed on the connection menu after all the camera settings were reset. So the password is no longer password, if you see what I mean, it's been changed now to something else. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Hopefully it's not 0000 or 1234. So apart from the P950 and the P1000 that they've done that, they've also updated the Nikon Message Center for Mac users and added support for the new Mac operating system, Sonoma. And they've ended support for Big Sur version 11. So some important updates there, perhaps not applicable to you, but it covers most cameras. All right. Yeah, little updates. And again, it's to do with European legislation more than anything else. Now on to some fun things. Z8 and Z8 were the best-selling cameras for 2023 at MAP Cameras. It's a quite a big camera retailer in Japan. So Nikon Z8 took a first spot and Nikon Z8 the second. So that just shows that both of those releases were quite popular in Japan. That's right. They led the way and the charge over and above the Sony A7C Mark II, Canon EOS R6 Mark II, and all the other Sonys, Fujis, Ricohs even. So well done, Nikon. They're actually Way down in 15th place, we have the ZFC, so still a top seller over there at Map Camera, which is interesting because it is an older model in comparison to the Z8 and the ZF, but pretty impressive that they've managed to beat all other brands, essentially. Exactly. And then also Nikon won four TIPA awards for Nikon ZF, which was the best full-frame expert camera, as they called it. Z8 was a winner of best full-frame professional camera. And then we also got two lenses, uh, Z135 1.8 S lens, which was winner of the best professional portrait lens, as well as Z180 to 600 lens, which won the best super telephoto zoom lens. Awards all around, I'm really glad for Nikon to actually release good products that people enjoy, but they also win awards because they are very good. Exactly. Okay, well, now let's uh, actually talk about interesting things that happened in the last couple of weeks. It's all about Nikon acquiring RED. So Nikon finally completed the acquisition of RED. So that happened a few weeks ago. In the final step of acquisition, the RED president's Jared Land and RED's founder James Jannard became advisors and KG Oisho of Nikon Imaging Business Unit became a CEO of RED and Tommy Rice, executive vice president of RED, moved into the co-CEO position. So little things here and there, that's all happened just right in time before the NAB show in Las Vegas. NAB stands for National Association of Broadcasters. It's one of the biggest videographers and cinematographer shows in the United States. And that was held between 13th and 17th of April. There, Red was showing their newly launched cameras. So there were two cameras there is Red Digital V Raptor X, which was a large format camera with an 8K sensor, global shots, yada, yada, yada. So, and then the second camera was V Raptor XL, and it's basically a similar camera, but with all features built in that's designed for kind of high volume productions. Um, and they both were expensive. The more interesting things for us still photographers, is that RED was a part of Nikon stand. However, however, they had a clear brand in there where they had Nikon next to Mark Roberts Bosch Control, which is based in England, UK, and also RED, which is based in Los Angeles. So very interesting, all big part of it. I don't know if Nikon was at NAB show before, but now it kind of came with goods and those big goods were red and their new cameras. Nikon have been at NAB in previous years as Mark Roberts Motion Control because that has been their their main. Mark Roberts, before it was acquired by Nikon, were at that show. And I know for a fact that they have been there in recent years. But moving on from that, there was an exclusive live 
panel at the show with Jared Land, who was now the ex Red president, entitled Red After Nikon Acquisition, Where We Go From Here. There is actually a, a video of that on YouTube, which you can watch, and we'll put a link in the description box for you as well if you're interested. Yeah, I think that's uh, one of the panels that a lot of videographers were looking forward to because the now ex-president of Jerry Land actually spoke about what's going to happen next. So it's one of the things where we can speculate, but then we have actually the owners of the companies talking about the acquisition of Nikon and what they're going to do in the future. So a couple of things there as a clear branding that red is going to stay red. Nikon confirmed it several times. So that was one interesting thing that came out of it. Also part of this is red said that they will support Canon RF mount and also auto focus on their red cameras. So that's something that Red did before Nikon acquired Red. So that was interesting. What we also had is a, a little mentioning that Nikon will consider senior lenses sometime in the future. And my question to you, Becky, is do you think those are going to be Z-mount senior lenses or they're going to be cinematographers industry standard PL mount lenses. What are your thoughts? My thoughts are that they would do PL mount because it seems more logical that they would do a mount that fits more than just red cameras, shall we say. But I honestly don't know. I would love a Z mount cine line. It has been argued before, before this acquisition was on the table and before we were even talking about it and knew that it was going to happen, that Nikon could absolutely do a range of cine lenses in the Z mount. But similarly, we know that they have certainly hinted at it before. So I think that we're looking at PL mount potentially in the in the distant or not immediate future. Well, that's that's very exciting. I think it's going to be both eventually. And the reason for that being is that they also hinted that a joint venture, aka a Nikon red camera or the camera that combines both the technologies it's a few years away and my guess is that obviously we'll have red cameras big and expensive cameras and then we may have a dedicated line of z cine video cameras and then maybe we will have a cine lenses with a z mount that will have all the autofocus features of nikon z system but on a dedicated video camera. So that's my thinking. I think obviously PL mount lenses are probably a little bit closer compared to let's say Z mount signal lenses, but who knows, you never know. Maybe they both will take a few years. Who knows? And here's the thing, Becky. When I was in LA, I had a very interesting conversation with a cinematographer, Christopher Malcolm, who is using red cameras on his shoots quite often. And we discussed all this, but then I actually caught up with him today and we discuss the news we're discussing with you. So this video is going to be out next week. So definitely stay tuned for that. It's going to be an interesting conversation. So hopefully that will share some light on the Nikon acquisition of Red. But who knows? I haven't edited it yet. It may be nothing there. But check <laughs> next week. <laughs> check back in next week just to be on the safe side. In the meantime, there has been some speculation that Nikon began steps to acquire Red due to the lawsuit that Red originally filed on them. I don't know if this is true. This seems like a very extreme response to a lawsuit, but you know, what do you think? Do you think there's any truth or any kind of reality to that? Well, this article came out on Petapixel, right? And I'm reading there, you know, what they've written. It says, Nikon confirmed that it began considering acquiring Red due to the lawsuit the cinema company filed against Nikon back in 2022. So it starts with this. Then they go through the whole lawsuit that Red sued Nikon, then Nikon filed back. Then they settled, right? So at this point, they just speculation and they think that, well, because they confirmed that they started to think about it in 2022, it may be because Red sued them. So uh, in my opinion, there's nothing really concrete there. I think it's just a pure speculation on the pixel part. But you know what? It gets the clicks, so whatever, isn't it? It's the life of the internet website. <laughs> Can't trust anyone these days. <laughs> All right. So then they basically base the speculation on the quote that Hiroki Ikagami, who is executive vice president and general manager of the Imaging Business Unit, told to Peter Pixel. Basically, he said, and I quote this, due to lawsuit, we had an opportunity to understand and learn more about Red itself and Red's history. And we had an opportunity to speak with the founder, Jim Jarrett. We also recognized 
that the professional digital cinema market is huge and covers many areas. And since the Z8 and Z9 launches, we've seen a growing market in the creative area. So because of that quote that they learned about the business and they spoke to the founder, I don't know if that's a true speculation. I, I can understand where they're coming from, but I wouldn't really say that it is what it is. It's obviously, we will find out about it maybe something like five to ten years down the road. But what do you think, Becky? Do you think it's pure speculation? Is it yay or nay? I mean, I'd say that that interview answer is pretty damning when it comes to looking at whether or not there's truth in it. I honestly don't think that that is the reason. Surely they must have been thinking about it beforehand. It doesn't take sort of a short period of time to acquire business. There would have been a lot of thought going into this and probably a lot of capital involved as well so unless they have just like a little account set aside for oh let's buy companies that are trying to give us trouble honestly who knows i don't know the inner machinations of their minds but i do think that that it's a sensible move from them either way perhaps they were looking at acquiring a cine camera company of some sort and then this opportunity came about and they thought well this this solves the problem it kills two birds with one stone for want of a better phrase okay well to be honest with you i have no beef in this game i get nothing out of this but <laughs> what i'm excited about is nikon became quite a big player in the cinematographer's market and then up to them what they will create in terms of their dedicated video line as well as Red System. And now you mentioned Mark Roberts Motion Control Company, which Nikon acquired, I think, three, four years ago. And it's based in the UK. It's actually fairly close to where we both based. And we generally, when we go filming, we generally pass their buildings. And I know you've been there. And they let Mark Roberts Motion Control Company run by itself. And because of this, because they are... Uh, being fairly independent, but they also get access to all the Nikon technology, we starting to see quite a lot of products in that niche that are quite competitive. And we start to see those robot arms becoming cheaper and cheaper and starting to be aimed at consumer market as well. So my hope is if Nikon runs RED the same way as they run Mark Robbins Motion Control, then I think... Red is in good hands where they will get the access, but at the same time, they will stay independent so they can be creative and competitive on their side of the industry. And obviously, Nikon will get Red technology and will implement in the cheaper products aimed for aspiring videographers who can't afford very expensive cinematographer's cameras. Well, I never would have made the name Red synonymous with <laughs> entry level or cheap cameras, but you know, the future is infinitely hopeful. <laughs> Yes, what I meant is that I assume that the red stays red and that's expensive, yeah, but, uh, you know, Nikon will release their dedicated video cameras which are going to be price-wise below that. But realistically yeah. speaking, you're looking at Komodo Red and that one's priced in UK, I think, it's about £5,500. If you think about it, Z9 is about 5500 So if you are cinematographer and that's your mm. bread and butter, that's actually and not expensive camera for cinematographers. Obviously, it's all relative, but we're talking about professional cinematography industry, if you see what I mean. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you make a valid point. Well, what do you think, viewers? Are you happy about this acquisition? Are you excited about it? What do you think it's going to bring for us Died in the wool Nikon fans. Let us know in the comments. Moving on to some third party news for you the Tamron 28 to 75 f2.8, that little lens we talked about a few weeks ago, the version 2 is now shipping. This is the Z lens that Tamron have brought out in the 28 to 75 2.8 space. So it is shipping. You can buy yours from Grays of Westminster. Yes, exactly. And I have it right here next to me. <laughs> Here you go. That's the one. No, sorry. That's a Nikon one. That's a Nikon one. But I'm actually filming on Tamron lens right now. It's set at 2.8. So Ooh. you can at least see what the video quality is like with that lens. But what's interesting to me, I have in my hands a Nikon 2875, which is based on Tamron design generation one. And the new lens is Gen 2. So what we're going to do, you and me, Becky, we're going to test them both and we're going to tell you which one is better again it's one of the things i'm really want to know because i am indeed puzzled by the tamron release personally so i want to know what the fuss is about 
yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing what the difference is in practical terms. We're going to go out and take lots of pictures of flowers with those two. Yeah, Tilly decided that she's a Tamron representative, so she's telling me <laughs> off now, saying you can't talk about Tamron lenses this way. Well, that's fine. I'm going to do this this next segment without you. <laughs> so our favorite Voigtlander, or Voigtlander as we call it over here, Nocton 75mm f1.5 full frame mirrorless lens for the Z mount has now been officially announced. You can pre-order it from Grey's Westminster. We talked about this also a few weeks ago when it had been sort of teased but wasn't officially announced yet. Um, it is designed exclusively for the Z mount. It's a full frame lens but obviously will work on DX cameras. It will communicate with the camera using electronic contacts just the same as all the other Vogtlander lenses do and it is manual focus. It is a very interesting lens because it's basically portrait at 1.5. Being an 85mm user yourself, what do you think about this lens? I am very excited. I've read a lot about this lens on Leica forums. Uh, for example, Fred Miranda has a big forum about this where people sharing the images. And it's based on the same design, so you know the image quality is going to be as good as on those images. So the bokeh rendering is amazing. It's small and light. A lot of people may want to compare it with the Nikon H5 1.8 S lens. You know my opinion about H5 1.8. I'm not a big fan of it, while a lot of people are raving about it. So don't trust me. Go try H5 1.8 S and decide for yourself. But because of the small and light design, I think it's very compact. You got all the active data passed through. You got your focus confirmation, all that. Image quality is fantastic. It's priced very reasonably. It's got beautiful metal design as, you know, some of you who tried void lenses, you know, the build quality is amazing. So overall, as a travel option, I think it's fantastic. Again, if you're a professional studio and portrait photographer where you need those focus, just go for Nikon Glass and obviously H5 1.2 is will be the ultimate choice. But I think personally, just based on the images I've seen online, I think it's incredible lens. I'm looking forward to it being released and added to the all Voigtland ZF system that Nikon Z system already have really. And if you haven't seen our videos where we show all the Voigtland full frame lenses or Nikon ZF camera, go definitely have a look at this. Releases mid-May. We will get a review unit as well to test. So stay tuned for that. Good. Next up, we have the Viltrox Autofocus 56mm f1.7, which is an APS-C lens, so it's a DX lens for the Nikon Z mount. It's uh, This little lens is only $169. It's super small and lightweight, and it's essentially going to be a portrait lens, like an 85mm equivalent, almost 1.7 for the DX range. Again, it does give the EXIF data through the camera body, which is great because a lot of third-party lenses don't, so it's always nice when they do. It is autofocus with a quiet focus motor, um, electronic aperture, all the rest that you would consider. We are going to be also reviewing this lens when it comes out. We're going to be putting it on our DX camera. Unique and ZF in DX crop. Yeah, we will try and get a DX camera for this one specifically. But it's great to see yet another lens in the Z range. I feel like the Z mount has had so many third party lenses in such a short space of time. I don't recall, if I'm honest, the the quantity of releases that like we're having now that we had for the F mount. I don't think it was the same pattern. So this is very exciting. Indeed. And uh, we've tried the 20 millimeter full frame autofocus 2.8 lens, which you can see review in the link in the comments below. And we were surprisingly excited about this lens and performance of it for the money. It was our first wheel trucks lens that we tried. It was $158. And for the travel setup, it performed really, really well. Overall sharpness is there. The main complaint was really about the vignette in which generally if you stopped it down to about f8 you should be fine but also the feedback that received in the comments under the other videos where a lot of people actually bought this lens and they said literally the same thing for the price it's unbeatable so i'm definitely looking forward to the 56 1.7 i'm glad that we are getting a lot of dx lenses and if you go on the internet you will see two different type of comments where people say we don't need dx line 
So we need full frame lenses, but then we also have people saying we need more lenses in DX lineup. And we finally have Sigma release the 3DX lenses. We have lots of Viltrox lenses available now. And Viltrox lenses are priced very attractively at $169, I think, as long as the performance is there. Again, if you're not a portrait photographer, I'd rather spend 170 bucks and get a portrait lens than let's say spend 700 pounds for portrait lens. I'd rather spend the 700 pounds on a lens the focal distance that you most use yourself. So if you haven't seen our review of the 20mm 2.8, go definitely check it out. Now, another little handy third-party gizmo for you, not a lens this time, but Atmos actually have announced the Ninja Phone Video Co-Processor. And if you look at this, this actually it encodes the camera's HDMI signal to ProRes or H.265, both formats in 10-bit quality for HDR. And essentially, you mount it on the top of your camera, your Z camera, for example, and fully utilize the incredible chip. Now, people don't talk about the chip in the iPhone 15 Pro and the Pro Max enough. They just they just don't. People have joked on the internet that there is no difference between the iPhone 15 and earlier versions. But if you look at what that chip is capable of, it is actually very, very smart for Atomos to have gone, hey, we're going to fully utilize this incredible processor and do something with it that will help videographers. And that's exactly what they've done. Yeah, I mean, the title of that announcement was your phone can be a Ninja 2. I think they should have changed it to your iPhone 15 or 15 Pro can be a Ninja 2 because my iPhone 12 or someone's Android phone is crying in the corner. But <laughs> what those things do really, your iPhone basically can become a monitor. So we have a little Ninja 5 that we use every now and then for our menu recordings and so all other things. So that's a ZK device which costs about five, six hundred pounds and you plug a SSD and it records there. So you can use this monitor as well. So now your iPhone can be a monitor. The bit that comes with it is actually process the footage and then outputs it to your phone. But it's also you can save the file on the phone so you can record it. You can do live streams with this. You know, so the opportunities are there uh, for the price of $399. I think some people may find it attractive. So I, I do find it to be a little bit expensive and probably I would buy a dedicated Ninja 5 for not much more. But I think it's an interesting device that maybe a lot of iPhone video creators may find very useful because the image from your mirrorless camera is definitely going to be much better quality than the footage from your iPhone. Let's be honest, just because of the size of the sensor more than anything else, but also because it's processed into specific H.265 codecs, which is going to be quite good if you want to edit your footage, let's say, on the computer later on. This is quite good to have. I guess it's aimed for, you know, for people who live stream, who do social media content and don't want to spend on a dedicated video device. But again, you will have your mirrorless cameras plugged into your phone. So, Again, I'm not sure how useful that is, but opportunities are there, I guess. I reckon that it would get, take our out and about live streams up a notch in terms of quality because we wouldn't have to film on the iPhone. The only issue it doesn't solve is connectivity in central London. Indeed. So maybe, maybe one day we'll try that. But for now, it's a wrap. Thanks for joining us today. It's her turn now. <laughs> <laughs> Aw, she needs a hug. I think we should change our show name with from Conan Becky Show to Conan Becky and Fury Animal Show. <laughs> That's right, and furry friends. Yes, thank you very much for watching or listening. Please give us a like and subscribe if you're on YouTube. If you are listening on a podcast platform, it would be most fantabulous if you could give us a follow, a rating, a review, all that good stuff. We are available on all platforms like Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, YouTube Unlimited, Spotify, you name it. If there is a podcast platform, we are there. Come check us out, leave us a review. You can also find us on the social medias of the world, just like... <laughs> just like this one. It's a bar Instagram or something. Yeah, just like Instagram. I am at Rebecca underscore Danese. The shop is at Nikon at Grace. And I'm at Konstantin Kochkin. We will see you at some point soon. Bye bye. <laughs> bye bye. Do you think those are going to be Z mounts in your lenses? 
or they're going to be cinematographers industry standard PL mount lenses. What are your thoughts? Mm. <laughs> Tilly has something well, to say on that. Tilly's got a lot to say, a lot more than I do to tell them. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> She's like, let me in. I want to talk about Nikon. I want to. Uh, exactly. I've got stuff to say. 